Hello, everyone. It was very short break for Polish participants, but I would like to welcome our English speaking guests. I'm so glad I can see you and uh, I would like to welcome you on our 12th International Scientific Symposium. And the subject is effective support for children with autism scientific approach. Uh, this is the schedule of our meeting. Uh, so we have really very nice guests from US. They will say and present the research. And also there is a um, PhD student, Anna Lubomirska. She will present her PhD studies uh, which she is doing together with Oslo University. So uh, I think the subjects are really interesting. Uh, for this who doesn't know, Institute for Child Development from Gdańsk, I just would like to say that we are running since 15 years and this is our scientific committee. I just would like to say that we are the member of Alliance for Scientific Autism Intervention and um, I can see some regards. So uh, nice to hear some nice words from abroad. Um, and um, I will present today uh, modern tools in staff and parents training. And for the supervisors and trainers, it's really important to have tools which are really effective in the training. Um, I just wanted to present some studies uh, done by Charles Hamad, uh, Richard Serna and Richard Fleming and more uh, and Leslie Marison. Sorry if I can't pronounce the names correctly. Um, uh, it's about extending the reach of early intervention training for participant, uh, a preliminary investigation of an online curriculum for teaching behavioral intervention knowledge in autism to families and service providers. Uh, so the study um, shows in, in this study, uh, the authors presented that internet-based training curriculum could be effective in training part, uh, practitioners about methods and procedures that, are, that form the primary basic of clinical intervention uh, common to many early uh, intervention, behavioral intervention programs. Um, it is uh, very important to know that we can uh, teach and uh, train people in many different ways. Uh, the most popular is hand-on-hand -hand training, but uh, two last years showed us that we have also developed new tools to train people uh, and uh, we need uh, some other tools which can help people to develop uh, some um, certificate certif uh, certain skills which can be helpful in the treatment and the results from pre and post tests divided into three groups uh, the results were for professionals parents and family members and para professionals para professionals and you can see uh, the graphs first graph is for professionals. And you can see that after test, post-test shows a much uh, developing of knowledge, that they had much more skills after attending in the online course. The same results we can see with parents and family members and uh, para-professionals. So three groups and through all the three groups, we can see the same results. We can see the progress in the skills which are really necessary in, in helping children with autism in the treatment. So this is one of um, 
Uh, one of the reasons we have created our own tool, which is in both languages, Polish and English. And um, this online course, uh, which is named in English, 15 minutes for treatment, in Polish, kwadrans dla terapii, has 33 episodes, which you can pay for and download on your computer. And you can have an access to this episodes anytime you want and you need. And in uh, this is also, uh, you can open the uh, episode which is necessary in this time. So you don't need to uh, follow uh, the numbers. You can open number 22, 12 ep episode whenever you need. We also have prepared educational materials, which you can download for free when you buy this online course. And uh, you can use these materials to create motivational systems or uh, activity schedules. And um, what are the main areas taught in the course? We, also, we are, of course, uh, concentrate on autism, but also early childhood education, special education, and child psychology. So these are the main areas. And who the course is intended for. So as you see, there is a big number of specialists which can get a lot of help from the course teachers, preschools, therapists, speech therapists, psychologists, educators, parents, family members, uh, guardians for children with developmental disorders, and anyone who is interested in supporting children with development disorder. Um, what you can learn from the course we have created. Uh, so the most important, you can learn effective intervention strategies for a child with autism. You can uh, learn how to organize educational materials and treatment settings. You can learn how to assess behavioral deficits, construct educational programs and analyze the progress during the treatment. You can learn how to motivate a child and uh, how to select the best teaching techniques, how to begin intervention, how to solve and manage problem behaviors, how to implement intervention at home and how to check the generalization. So, um, and uh, the, the course help parents to understand main rules of ABA, to organize the space for treatment in the child's home, to prepare motivational system in the home, to know the rules how to use child's motivational system, to know teaching methods recommended by therapists, to see how to introduce first educational program. The course helps specialists to know better the model described by Kranz and McLanahan to systematize knowledge, to repeat some um, therapy related issues and to make cooperation with parents by referring to specific episodes from the course. Uh, there are some opinions uh, also from Norway and other countries I am very thankful for uh, and uh, we can see they are really um, uh, good opinions uh, so I'm very glad uh, that people find it very helpful. Um, and we believe that spending 15 minutes time daily on self-education on our education pl platform allows platform users to strengthen skills and uh, they can uh, successfully use in everyday professional and family life. So I think uh, it's, um, it's really uh, good for therapists and parents to see uh, the, the uh, platform and to know our um, model as good as possible. 
So you can find the course, online course on our webpage, uh, 15 minutes for treatment. Uh, and I would like to show you the film which shows how we uh, present different um, areas. So film, please. When discussing the effectiveness of applied behavior analysis, we can't omit the research conducted by Jane Howard in 2005. She compared the effectiveness of intensive behavioral treatment with an eclectic treatment that combined different forms of intervention. The research showed that after 14 months of intensive behavioral intervention, in which children received 25 to 40 hours of intervention per week, children from the experimental group attained increased average scores in all measured areas. On the other hand, the children from the control groups attained lower scores. Regardless of whether the eclectic treatment was conducted individually for 30 hours a week or in a group setting for 15 hours a week. Notably, the biggest differences were observed in the pace of acquiring language skills, including both expressive and receptive language. Ultimately, our goal is for the child to follow a daily activity schedule from the moment he or she wakes up in the morning until he or she goes to bed. Of course, the type of schedule that you create depends on the child's functioning level, but usually we recommend starting from the simplest schedule format, which is typically based on matching symbols from the schedule to symbols on the activities. How can children communicate that they want to obtain an interesting object? It depends on their level of functioning and speech development. Children who can't talk can initiate interactions by simply making eye contact and extending their hands towards the desired object. For those who can talk, they can use sounds, words or sentences they can already say, such as drink, give me, can I have more? And so on. As we said earlier, incidental teaching is very helpful in teaching the skill of initiating interactions when teaching children with autism. In this video, you can see how to respond when students express their desire to complete a certain activity or obtain a certain object. Powiedz auto! Auto! Proszę bardzo, możemy się pobawić autkiem! As you saw in the video, you should use the child's motivation to teach new target responses. In this example, the skill that was taught was naming toys that the student wanted or preferred. Teaching self-care skills can be very difficult, which is why you should start with short schedules, for example three pages long. Always place the ending symbol on the last page. Use only manual prompts while teaching the student how to follow the schedule. Don't talk to the student and don't give verbal prompts or praise while he or she is performing the activity chain. Remember, the goal of activity schedules is to develop independence. It is possible that your verbal instructions or words of praise might make the child dependent on your presence. Praise your student only when he or she indicates that he or she has ended the task. As we mentioned earlier, as your child progresses, the activity schedule should be modified. At first, you can make them longer by adding new components of trained behavior chains on separate pages. Also, in time, if possible of course, you can progress from using schedules that include only pictures to those in the form of a written list. Good evening or 
Good afternoon, except when, when we are. My name is Ivona Ruta Sominka. Uh, I am a deputy director of Institute for Child Development Institute, and I will help Anna to, uh, to be with you during uh, our symposium. Now I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Sandra Gomez. Uh, she is an assistant director at Somerset Hills Learning Institute and she has been working with individu individuals with autism at the Institute for nearly 20 years. And uh, tonight or today, she will talk about establishing a generalized repertoire of engaging in in journal attending. So, Dr. Sandra, welcome. And now it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, please presentation, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge our colleagues and for all their help with uh, Ukrainians seeking refuge, refuge, so thank you. Today, I'm happy to share with you my dissertation and research project on establishing a generalized repertoire of initiating joint attending with children with autism. Please keep in mind that this project was completed in 2014 alongside my mentors, Dr. Sharon Reeve and Dr. Kevin Brothers, and is currently in preparation for publication. Deficits in joint attention affect 80 to 90% of children with autism, are typically evident before one year of age, and are often present before any diagnosis has been made. In the developmental literature, joint attention is typically defined as two people sharing attention with respect to an object or event and monitoring each other's attention to that object or event. Although widely used in the developmental literature, this definition is not operationally defined. In addition, joint attention has remained a cognitive term both in the developmental and behavior analytic literature. Attention is often referred to as a cognitive process of selectively concentrating or focusing on an aspect of the environment. This can be described as covert behavior, such as thinking, which is not observable and can only be inferred. As such, it might be incumbent on behavior analysts to reevaluate the term joint attention and instead consider the term joint attending. Attending has been defined as the discriminative responding based on some stimulus or stimulus property. An organism is typically attending to a stimulus when variations in that stimulus change behavior. Joint attending behavior refers to not one, but a class of responses that function to communicate with another person about an object or event in the environment. Joint attending behavior includes non-vocal communication, such as eye gaze alternation and pointing, and vocal communication, such as commenting about a stimulus in the environment. Previous research has focused primarily on visual cues, such as the initiator's eye gaze alternation between the interaction partner and a stimulus in the environment as a critical component of joint attending. This narrow focus, however, does not account for joint attending skills among children with visual impairments. Although eye gaze alternation might be a critical component, other critical components of joint attending include vocal and non-vocal communication, such as gestures like pointing, to direct another person to a stimulus in the environment. So for example, a person with a visual impairment is not able to engage in joint attending through eye gaze alternation with another person. However, a person with a visual impairment is able to engage in joint attending by vocally commenting um, about non-visual stimuli in the environment, such as auditory or olfactory stimuli. In this example, the initiator the person with a visual impairment is directing the interaction partner to the source of the sound or smell through his or her vocal communication, thereby recruiting attention from the interaction partner, which makes the function of this interaction social. Similarly, Lieberman and colleagues showed that a person with a hearing impairment can also engage in joint attending by engaging in eye gaze alternation or pointing to a visual stimulus in the environment with an interaction partner. This is important 
because to date, it appears that joint attending is typically considered to require a visual stimulus for both the initiator and responder to attend to. In 2005, Holt conceptualized the role of a novel item or event as an establishing operation that alters or increases the value of socially mediated stimuli as a reinforcer and evokes behavior such as pointing, eye gaze alternation that has been reinforced in the past by socially mediated stimuli. According to Holt's conceptualization, perhaps the presentation of stimuli should be novel during every trial when teaching joint attending. One strategy to increase novelty might be a trial unique procedure in which a novel stimulus or event is incorporated during each trial. To date, it appears that previous research has yet to evaluate a trial unique procedure as a strategy to increase novelty to teach joint attending. The current study extended the findings of my thesis project by further examining the use of experimenter defined categories across a variety of stimulus domains. The current study appears to be the first study to evaluate initiations for joint attending in the presence of olfactory stimuli. In addition, a three component generalization strategy, along with a trial unique procedure, prompt and prompt fading, script and script fading, and socially mediated consequences was evaluated to teach a generalized repertoire of initiating joint attending. Okay, so the participants were four boys who attended a private school for individuals with autism that used an applied behavior analytic intervention model. Sessions were conducted in 10 different locations within the participant school. Every sixth session, initiating joint attending was taught in a private home across five different rooms, and the order of the locations was randomly selected. 140 stimuli were used across seven categories. The categories included electronic toys, stationary toys, stimuli that were arranged in some unusual uh, placement, environmental sounds, animal sounds, pungent smells, and fragrance smells. To determine the stimuli for the olfactory categories, we used olfactory stimuli that Castro and colleagues determined could be detected by humans. Specifically, we used Yankee Candle spray bottles that uh, were used to uh, dis be dispensed into the rooms prior to the students walking um, into those rooms. Audio scripts were created based on statements made by three children of typical development. The audio scripts were played by the instructor and were selected on the basis that each participant could imitate the word or words recorded. As you can see, three different scripts were created for each category for a total of 21 scripts. Each script was randomly assigned per stimulus within each category. So for example, during stationary toys, script one was presented followed by script three and so on. The dependent variables, um, one of them was initiating joint attending. For visual stimuli, complete initiations for joint attending were defined as the participant orienting towards the target stimulus, orienting towards the interaction partner, and making a contextual comment further defined as scripted or unscripted. During the non-visual stimuli, so the auditory and olfactory categories, Complete initiations for joint attending were defined as the participant orienting towards the interaction partner when coming in contact with a smell in the environment or hearing a sound and making a contextual comment, again, further defined as scripted or unscripted. Scripted comments, model, or audio script present were scored and defined as the participants vocally matching the scripts. So for example, if the script was faded to look, and the participant said, look at that. As stated in the original script, a scripted comment model present was scored. Scripted comments model absent were defined as comments made in the absence of the model that matched previously taught scripts in each of the seven categories. So for example, if the participant said, that's awesome, when the script was not present, a scripted comment model absent was scored. 
This differs a little bit from previous research in which comments that matched fully faded scripts were scored as unscripted initiations. Unscripted comments during initiations for joint attending were scored and defined as vocal productions that differed from the scripts taught. In addition, unscripted comments were also, um, also included any combination of scripted or unscripted comments emitted by the participants. Non-contextual initiations for joint attending were those made towards items that the experimenter defined were not novel or arranged in some unusual placement to assess the extent to which participants discriminated between target stimuli that occasioned initiations for joint attending from those that did not, a free operant assessment was conducted during each session. A multiple baseline across participants design with a multiple probe was used to assess the effectiveness of the treatment package. As you can see on the screen, each participant was presented with five training categories of stimuli and two across generalization categories of stimuli. Five training categories were used to increase the likelihood that initiating for joint attending generalized from stimuli in training categories to stimuli from untrained categories. And the assignment of categories was counterbalanced across all participants. Script and prompt fading procedures were not used during baseline. Instead, if a participant initiated for joint attending, the experimenter responded with a brief social comment related to the target stimulus and oriented to the stimulus when applicable. During intervention, if the participant attempted to walk past any of the target visual stimuli without initiating joint attending within two seconds, the experimenter used manual guidance to manually prompt correct responses. In addition, the experimenter simultaneously activated a voice recorder script out of view for the participant to imitate as the participant's behavior was prompted in the direction of the interaction partner. Mastery criterion was defined as initiating joint attending in the presence of at least 80% of training stimuli for two consecutive sessions in the absence of audio script models. Initially, full audio script models were played and were systematically faded until they were completely removed. And as you can see, there were only three fading levels. Programming for response generalization included teaching each participant three different vocal responses in the presence of a variety of stimuli in each of the five training categories. To program for stimulus generalization, 140 stimuli were assigned to seven experimenter-defined categories, as previously mentioned, and initiating joint attending was also taught in a variety of locations in each of two settings, so the participant's school and a private home. Ongoing response and st a stimulus generalization were assessed during each session with stimuli that were not associated with teaching, so two untrained stimuli per session from two untrained categories. Specifically, a different generalization stimulus from the two across category probes was assessed per session per participant. In addition, generalization probes across people and settings were ass assessed during pre and post tests and generalization probe trials were identical to baseline trials. All right, now for the important stuff, the data. So figure one displays the percentage of training trials and across generalization probe trials with correctly completed initiations for joint attending for all participants as shown on the y-axis and sessions are shown on the x-axis. During baseline, all participants' initiations for joint attending were at 0% for training trials. With the introduction of the intervention, all participants' initiations increased to criterion levels, which was, again, two consecutive sessions at 80% or above. Similarly, 
Similarly, all participants' initiations during generalization probe trials also increased and maintained at criterion levels during the follow-up assessments. This figure also displays the number of initiations for joint attending during the non-contextual stimuli, which remained at zero for all participants with the exception of Max at the bottom panel, who emitted an, who emitted an initiation towards a non-contextual stimulus during his uh, 37th session, and then it remained at zero for the remainder of the study. This graph displays the number of scripted model present and model absent and unscripted comments made during the training trials. And it also displays scripted and unscripted comments made during the across category generalization trials. The numbered arrows along the top of each panel indicate the script fading levels. So as you can see during baseline, the participants did emit some comments that were quantified as unscripted since scripts were not in place during baseline. During script and script fading procedures, all participants' comments increased. And as you can see, most of their comments uh, consisted of scripted model absent, which are represented with the open circles. During the follow-up assessments, most of the comments were again um, scripted model absent across all of the participants. So in sum, the results of the current study demonstrated that the participants acquired a generalized repertoire of initiating joint attending across a variety of stimuli, people, and settings. With the introduction of the intervention, all participants' data systematically increased in the percentage of initiations for joint attending and maintained during the follow-up assessments. In addition, all participants demonstrated increases in the percentage of initiations for joint attending during their across-category generalization probe stimuli and the cross-response generalization as well. Although not shown here, Inter-observer agreement data were collected during 72% of sessions or higher with a mean of 97% across all conditions and participants. The current study contributed to the literature by evaluating the use of non-visual stimuli, the auditory and olfactory stimuli. Specifically, the current study extended the findings of Gomes and colleagues by evaluating the second non-visual modality, which is the olfactory uh, stimuli, in addition to the auditory stimuli. Although there were increases in initiations, as we just saw, for joint attending during the four non-visual categories, so the two olfactory and the two auditory uh, categories, some might argue that the present study's definition for non-visual stimuli does not meet the required components of joint attending because it does not require the initiator and responder to attend to a visual stimulus. In previous research, joint attending definitions have typically included orienting to a target stimulus as a measurable component during the presentation of visual stimuli. However, as shown by Ricard, a person with a visual impairment can in fact engage in joint attending with an interaction partner. As such, the need for a visual stimulus for the initiator and uh, responder to attend to may not always be necessary or feasible. The current study also supports previous research in that a trial unique procedure might have contributed to the novelty of the stimuli presented, thereby increasing the potency of the establishing operation and evoking initiations for joint attending. Contributions to the existing literature were also made by evaluating the use of a three-component generalization strategy. Most likely, multiple exemplar training facilitated generalization of initiations for joint attending. Anecdotal reports from instructors and parents revealed that participants initiated joint attending in their respective homes and at school outside of teaching sessions. For example, Hunter's mom reported that upon entering Starbucks, Hunter typically engaged in joint attending by commenting on the different uh, smells, which he typically didn't do prior to the intervention. 
So these anecdotal reports uh, suggest that the three component generalization strategy was effective to teach generalized, um, a generalized repertoire of initiations for joint attending. I know there was a lot there. If uh, you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I now would like to show you some video. We're first going to look at some video um, during baseline. Then we're going to look at uh, video clips from teaching and then maintenance. So if we can please play the video. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Sandra, for a great lecture. I think uh, the subject you were presenting is really very important. And uh, there is no limit of research like yours. It should be repeated and repeated to show people how important it is to teach children to, in to initiate joint attention. So thank you so much. I hope uh, people will get, uh, will get possibility to use the knowledge you showed in your lecture. Thank you once more. Thank you for attending and uh, wish you a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we will move to the next next presenter, uh, Anna Lubomirska. She's a psychologist, therapist, and trainer from Institute for Child Development. She's also doing her doctor thesis at Oslo University and the research she will present is a part of her doctoral thesis. So Anya, very welcome and I give you the lecture. Thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me and Thanks see Shuman. the slides. Okay, yes, great. we can hear you, we can okay. see you and great. see your presentation. Okay, so, great. Good luck. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as Anya said, I, I'm going to talk about uh, the social referencing observation scale for children scale development. Uh, and it is the part, the first phase of my PhD project under supervision of Zygmunt Eldevik and Svein Eikeset from Oslo Met University in Norway. And the reason uh, why I'm doing this in, uh, in English is because uh, the whole project is conducted and described in this language. So um, this first phase uh, was described in the article um, published last year in Behavioral Interventions. Uh, and the other two parts of this project uh, are the development and validation of the social referencing observation scale as a screening instrument for ASD and teaching the first component of social referencing, reacting to new and missing objects in the environment. Uh, so the whole idea lying behind this project and the main goal of it uh, is to create a screening instrument for ASD uh, that can be used uh, at press schools by um, non-specialists, so uh, by preschool teachers, uh, and then to propose some uh, 
teaching programs, some interventions in order to compensate uh, for the observed deficits and teach these deficits or compensate these deficits step by step. So the first question that we should ask when uh, undertaking uh, such a huge endeavor as creating a scale is why? So uh, the obvious answer is a steep increase in the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder observed throughout the world uh, and huge consequences of this diagnosis for future development and learning. So uh, the great importance of this diagnosis uh, uh, for finding the right educational path for the child. And this uh, leads us uh, uh, back to the need for early diagnosis. And why did we choose social referencing at, as uh, the evaluated construct? Uh, it is because uh, social referencing is one of the most important deficits uh, in children with ASD at the same time being, being not typical uh, for children with other disorders. Uh, uh, but also it is because uh, we observe uh, problems with presenting mm, social referencing behaviors in uh, children with autism, even though uh, we teach them many social skills uh, about emotions, about how to recognize them, react to them, still uh, we observe such problems in natural situations. And uh, may we see uh, the video please right now? Okay, so I think it was obvious what was going on uh, on this video, but if not, uh, the teacher asked the boy to go to the room and sit at his table. And he just did, even though he saw what he saw. Uh, so uh, why these deficits in social referencing behaviors are so important? Because they may prevent from creating secure attachment uh, they also impact early communication and language development and may lead to challenging behaviors in future. So, of course, there are some instruments measuring social referencing to some extent, for example, S or S2 or CARS or ADOS or some interviews based on diagnostic criteria. Uh, but uh, all of them are based on interviews or can only be conducted by specialists, for example, psychologists. So we see the need uh, for creating social referencing screening instrument, but based on direct observation at conducted by non-specialists, as I said before, uh, for example, by uh, preschool teachers. And we hope that such evaluation may become a part of standard preschool assessment. So what is social referencing? Traditionally, it is described as a process in which one person utilizes another person's interpretation of the situation to formulate his or her own interpretation of it. But in our project, we perceive social referencing as a behavior chain which contains two links, each consisting of stimulus and response. Uh, and such uh, perception of uh, social referencing was described uh, first by Gerwitz and Peles Nogueras and then the Quincy Poulson, Townsend and Taylor in their articles. So altogether, we have four steps. Uh, first one is ambiguous novel stimulus, for example, the sight of an unfamiliar adult or situation. In case of our research, it was uh, the experimenter uh, changing his facial expressions. Then we had uh, the response from the child, which is observing or referencing a present, another pers a person present in this situation. In case of our research, it was the experimenter. 
Then we have the response from the observed person, for example, some verbal or nonverbal cues. And in case of our research, it was the experimenter's invitation to look into the bag or play with the toy or look into the book. And then we had the child's next response. And because these cues can be either of approval, for example, smile or head nod, or disapproval, for example, frown, fearful expression, or head shake, it can, it can occasion a uh, different kind of responding from the child. So approaching or avoiding uh, this uh, new ambiguous stimulus. Uh, so the steps that we uh, um, take during creating the scale was first creating scenarios in which we can assess social referencing. And these uh, scenarios were based on Sigmund's research. And uh, we have three scenarios, fear, pain and joy, which means that in each of these scenario, the child observes uh, the experimenter presenting this emotion so presenting fear pain or joy then we uh, or the uh, subject matter expert panel identified social referencing behaviors that are uh, typical or normal for uh, children of typical development in these scenarios then we operationalized these behaviors we did pilot research then we revised the scale. For example, we removed some items that were not frequent enough or merged some other items. Uh, and then we conducted the main research. And as for our participants, we had 60 participants in the pilot study and 204 participants in main research. And uh, uh, the participants were aged between two and a half and five years of age, because this is the typical age of preschoolers in Poland. We started from uh, five separate age cohorts, but later on uh, we um, assessed the whole group uh, together. And all children uh, that participated in our uh, research con um, attended mainstream preschools in Gdańsk, Poland. So in order to be sure that uh, these children are children of typical development, uh, we evaluated them by the child achievements chart, which is based on observation of the child in everyday situations and educational activities for uh, at least one month. And all of our participants were scored high, which is uh, typical for the standard preschooler. Then we assessed them with social responsiveness scale and all participants were scored within normal range. And additionally, we knew that they had no record of uh, needing psychological help. And we also did not detect any uh, significant differences in social status or previous educational experiences between our participants. So as for the procedure, the first author was the experimenter. So that was me. And uh, the experimenter did, uh, did not have any knowledge of participants beforehand. And every child was examined separately in a separate room in uh, his or her preschool, preschool. And during the testing, the experimenter tried to play naturally with the child, weaving these scenarios into the play. And uh, the scenarios were presented always in the same order. So fear, pain, then joy, with about five to 10 seconds break in between. And one scenario uh, took approximately one minute. Um, during the testing, during the evaluation, also the preschool teacher was present in the room uh, who sat quietly uh, uh, for, during the scenario, during the presentation of the scenario and for about five seconds after the scenario was completed. And then he uh, showed some empathic reactions, for example, uh, through facial expressions or vocal and verbal cues. Scoring was done immediately after the completion of each scenario based on lived, lived observation. And every item was scored either zero or one. So a score of zero was given when the child demonstrated typical social referencing as it was operationalized. 
and a score of one was given for any other type of response, a partial response or no response at all. And as for the results, the most common behaviors was looking at the person, so looking at the experimenter, and then taking some action with the materials. So in other words, the most typical social referencing behavior when encountering a novel and ambiguous stimulus was to observe the reaction of other present person and then, only then after observing, taking some action. And what we also saw was that looking at the person experiencing fear and pain, so during these two scenarios, was recorded more often than looking at the experimenter during the joy scenario. And this negativity bias is reported also in other studies. So actually what we saw was the uh, presentation of this social referencing behavior chain. So novel and ambiguous situation, which was the experimenter presenting some facial expressions, leading uh, to the child observing the experimenter, leading to the experimenter giving some uh, cues on how to behave, for example, inviting to play with the toy, leading to some child's reaction. So all the behaviors outside this chain were present with low frequency and later on were removed from the scale. And after revision, we have nine behaviors in the fear scenario, seven behaviors in pain scenario, and three behaviors in joy scenario. And uh, what is interesting uh, is that uh, one of the behaviors not frequent enough, so removed from the scale, was looking at the preschool teacher, because we thought that based on the theory of uh, social referencing, the child might be more apt to observe uh, the person who was known to him beforehand, so the preschool teacher, not the experimenter, but it was not the case. In the total scores for all three uh, scenarios, there were no significant differences between genders. And uh, as for the age, there were some differences, uh, sorry, uh, there, was some, uh, there were some uh, differences between genders in the youngest age cohort. And for the age of of the participant, the only significant difference was between the youngest age cohort and uh, the rest four of these age cohorts. And uh, based on this research, research uh, of our um, evaluation, it appeared that Soros is valid and reliable. We assessed reliability uh, using unweighted CAPAS. And it was uh, high to moderate for some items. And to sum up, our results suggest that social referencing behaviors are rather stable phenomenon for preschool children, uh, similar uh, no matter uh, for the gender with, with no uh, differences for the gender and uh, no uh, huge differences for the age. Uh, and as I said before, for, in following research, we did not divide children into age cohorts. So the next steps, obviously, was uh, using SOROS uh, um, and check if it's able to detect deficits um, in social referencing in children with ASD and compare its results uh, with other instruments measuring social referencing such as SRS or ADOS or CARS and thus then teaching components step by step components of social referencing chain and uh, now I can safely say that we did detect uh, significant differences between children of typical development and uh, children with ASD uh, based on the SOROS thank you very much Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, it was really interesting, and I have to say that the job Anya was doing with all this testing, it was just impressive. It was lots of, lots of uh, hours spending with kids, 
but the tool will be very very useful uh, to check uh, uh, how the children are doing with this very important social skills so thank you anna now i would like to present uh, the next presenters yes i would like to welcome a very good team from New York Child Learning Institute. Uh, Dr. Susan Wenner, she is a co-founder, director, and principal uh, of the New York uh, Child Learning Institute. And Dr. Alison Gillis, uh, she is behavior consultant and research coordinator also at NICELY. And uh, it will be a very interesting subject, promoting independence in an educational program. So Susan, now your turn. Great, you thank you. you. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Wonderful. Yes, uh, presentation, please. Thank you. All right, wonderful. So thank you so much for inviting us here today. Dr. Gillis and I will be discussing systems needed to promote independence in an educational program. We will be using photographs and video clips from the New York Child Learning Institute in the United States. During our talk, we will be discussing two systems of an educational program necessary to promote independence. Okay. We will briefly discuss the use of activity schedules and the use of a zone system of supervision. So the first question is, how do we promote independence? To begin, it is essential to teach our children to complete lengthy response chains and to engage in independent transitions from one activity to the next. Photographic and written activity schedules provide a framework for helping achieve these goals. An activity schedule is a set of pictures or words that cue someone to engage in a sequence of activities. The goal is to enable children with autism to perform tasks and activities without direct prompting and guidance. This book authored by Drs. McClanahan and Krantz has been translated into Polish and we strongly urge you to purchase it. So now our question is, how do we begin? First, we must arrange the environment to accommodate the new system. The activity schedule must be within reach. Stimuli corresponding to the activities depicted in the photograph must be easily accessible. And initially, the environment should be relatively devoid of extraneous stimuli. You can see from this next slide that over time, the number of negative comparison stimuli increases. Additional materials are presented along with the positive comparison stimulus. Here's an example of a photographic activity schedule that consists of one photograph on a page corresponding to a specific activity. You can see that we superimpose the written text directly on the photographs and over time, the photographs are systematically cut until all that remains is the written text. Here's an example of a sequence of photographs to teach a young girl to check her appearance. Here, the student moves the token to indicate the completion of one activity and the beginning of another. A written word on each page corresponding to a particular activity. A sequence of activities presented in a list format. A written schedule on an iPad. And a written schedule on an iPhone. Regardless of the way in which the stimuli are presented, the way in which we teach an, an individual to follow an activity schedule is the same. So how do we teach a child to follow a schedule? Schedule following involves, involves five components. First, opening the binder or turning a page in the schedule. Second, pointing to the activity depicted on the page. Third, obtaining the depicted materials. Fourth, completing the activity. And fifth, putting the materials away. It is important not to stand between the child and his or her next response. The child or adolescent must attend to the relevant stimuli in his or her environment, and in this case, the schedule or the corresponding stimuli, 
and not to the adult. The instructor needs to be skillful in providing manual guidance, that is hand over hand prompts, graduated guidance, lessening the intensity of the manual prompts, spatial fading, systematically moving the manual prompt away from the child's hand, shadowing, following the child's movements without touching the child, and decreased adult proximity. Here you see full manual prompts. The intensity of the prompt is lessened over time. Here the prompt is moved away from the hand to the wrist. The instructor's hands are following the child's movements. And here the instructor has decreased her proximity from the child. For a child's first schedule, activities should be familiar or already mastered. Activities should have clear endings. A first schedule might include completing a puzzle, using a scissor to cut shapes, matching colors, matching shapes, having a snack. For a young adolescent, the activities might be similar with a shift in the responses practiced. Activities might be used to strengthen communication skills, cooperative play with a peer, self-care activities, flossing teeth, academic responses, reading, gross motor activities, riding a bike, cleaning responses such as straightening up your desk, and community activities. More independence means less need for support from adults in the future. So in addition to identifying curricular goals and to teaching a child or a young adolescent to follow an activity schedule, it is important to arrange the classroom environment and staffing assignments to encourage independence. In a given classroom, there are two different staff assignments that move children between activities, man-to-man -man and zone supervision. Most common is a man-to-man -man supervision system, which I will describe first. In 1972, LaLauren and Risley stated that in a man-to-man -man system, each teacher is assigned the responsibility of monitoring a child or a group of designated children throughout all activities and during each transition. At the New York Child Learning Institute, the instructor oversees the activities in which the student or students are engaged and supervises child transitions across activities and across different locations. So what you're gonna see here is that the instructors are working with one or two students at a time and are accompanying students during transitions. So video, please. Thank you. Okay. So man-to-man -man supervision has tremendous merit while assisting children to follow activity schedules, to acquire basic attending skills while working at a table with different stimuli, to locate and obtain materials in the absence of disruptive behavior, and to exit a classroom and to enter a different location. There might be some challenges inherent in a man-to-man -man supervision system. When working with one child, the child might become dependent on adult prompts. For example, while transitioning across locations, the child might look back to ensure that the adult is following. Similarly, there could also be some challenge while working with more than one child at a given time in a man-to-man -man supervision system. So first, if one child displays challenging behavior, teaching for the other child or children temporarily stops. Instructor attention is often focused on the child displaying the challenging behavior. And second, 
A child might be idle while he or she waits for a peer or an adult to transition to the next activity. Another method of supervision involves the use of zones. A zone system is a system of classroom management and teamwork that defines the adult roles largely by location. Instructors do not follow students across zone areas. According to LaLauren and Risley in 1972, a zone system occurs when instructors are assigned the responsibility for a particular area and assume the responsibility for those children passing through it. So here is a brief video of some of our young children at the New York Child Learning Institute in a zone supervision system. A video, please. So in a zone system, the classroom is divided into zones or learning areas. Here is a zone map that corresponds to the classroom that you just observed. The classroom has two zones. Zone one has child desks, a group table and cubbies. Zone two has child desks, cubbies, and a toy train area. As staff members transition into and out of the classroom, the number of zones in a classroom changes. A zone can be changed at any time as long as the adult recognizes the physical boundaries of his or her responsibilities. Here is the same classroom with three zones, three instructors present. And here is that same classroom with four zones, four instructors present. The maps are tacked onto the bulletin board in the classroom and are easily accessible. Some of the most important benefits to the zone system are that the children are no longer waiting for peers and or adults to transition into other areas. And second, the system accommodates those children who need more time to transition into other areas or activities. And third, it provides opportunities for instructors to better work with colleagues um, in the classroom. Allison, you're muted. She is, yeah. One moment, we're having some difficulties on Allison's end. Just give her a moment. So, proszę o chwilę cierpliwości. Allison ma problem. Um, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yes. You are on. <laughs> okay. You can hear me. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now we're faced with several questions. One, when is it appropriate to move from a man to man to a zone system of supervision? Two, how do we get started? Three, how do we measure the usefulness of a zone system and what are the treatment outcome measures? And four, what are the difficulties associated with implementing a zone system? Now let's address each of these questions. So the first question is, when is it appropriate to move from man to man to a zone system of supervision? Using our own experiences over the past 10 years, we have found that the following prerequisite skills are necessary to make the transitions possible. First, students should be able to follow a photographic or written activity schedule with minimal manual guidance. 
Second, disruptive behavior should be minimal during transitions. And last, students should have had opportunity to practice transitioning across the room to obtain stimuli over the previous months. Our second question is, how do we get started? To begin, it is important to arrange the environment to accommodate the new system. For example, in a classroom setting, first, the zone borders need to be clearly identified. Each zone might have both a teaching station, for example, a table, chairs, and cubbies, as well as leisure activities, like a computer, toys, or a snack table. Different maps should be created so that the shifts from two to three or four zones in a classroom is clear. Second, the position of the staff member and the locations of the motivational systems are strongly considered. Staff members in one, zo one zone should not have their backs to another student in another zone. Third, furniture and stimuli within the zone should be easily accessible to the students. The instructors should be in a position to access all areas in the zone, regardless of any zone shifts. Fourth, individual zones should be close enough in proximity. When the zones shift, it is important that an instructor from one zone is able to be responsible for a larger area. Fifth, zones should be carefully crafted with learners' needs in mind. A student who requires intensive intervention in the same zone should not be in the same zone as another student who requires a similar level of intervention. And lastly, training should be provided to assist the instructional staff in communicating across the zones. It's important that a staff member communicates when they're leaving a zone, when a student is entering another zone, or when help is needed in a particular zone. Our next question is, how do we measure the usefulness of the zone system? What are our treatment outcome measures? In 1972, the Lauren and Risley compared a zone system of supervision with a man-to-man -man system and found that the children were more engaged during transitions in the zone system than in the man-to-man -man systems. But at the New York Child Learning Institute, engagement would not be an, an informative measure to compare supervision systems. For the most part, our students are engaged throughout the school day, regardless of whether a man-to-man -man or a zone system is being used. To further analyze this, we collected on-task data within a given school year for classroom one and classroom two at our program. Data were collected every 10 minutes across all students in the class during a two hour period on a monthly basis. The first graph shows the percentage of students engaged in classroom one across consecutive months. Classroom one uses a man-to-man -man system of supervision. The mean percentage of students engaged was 93%. The second graph shows the percentage of students engaged in classroom two across consecutive months. Classroom two uses a zone system of supervision. The mean percentage of students engaged was also 93% in this room. So the data are similar regardless of the type of supervision system being used. The last question that we'll address is, what are the difficulties associated with implementing a zone system? To answer this question, we distributed a form to 17 instructors working in a zone system at our school. We asked our team to list aspects of the zone that they liked and aspects of the zones that they did not like. Here are some of the positive comments that we received. One, supervision of students is more evenly distributed. As learners move through the zones, they can be more fully monitored. Two, zones help to increase independence because a learner can move through zones without having to be followed. Three, instructors are better able to fade their proximity from the students. Four, instructors are able to better focus on the learners in their zones rather than try to keep track of learners throughout the entire classroom. Five, zone systems can be effective in different locations, for example, in the classroom, in the gym, or in the lunchroom. And six, 
the environmental design fosters more opportunity for peer interaction in the classroom. Our systems are continually being created and improved, and the communication among staff members is becoming more precise. An additional benefit of zone systems is that stimulus control can transfer from instructor prompts to the relevant aspects of the environment. Rather than looking back to ensure that an adult is following closely behind, the child's behavior comes under the control of the key stimuli that should serve to evoke the behavior. To teach students to respond to relevant stimuli, instructors must use teaching systems and supervision assignments that are likely to bring responding under the control of these stimuli rather than from prompts from other people. So to promote a learner's focus on the relevant stimuli, we might use a photographic or written activity schedule, manual prompts delivered from behind, alter the intensity and location of our prompts, shadow learner responses, and ultimately decrease our proximity to the learners. All of these strategies can be used in combination with a zone system of staff assignment. In addition to the positive comments that we received about zones, here are some of the concerns that we had also received. One, it is challenging to work on teacher-directed activities with one learner while others are transitioning into the zone. Two, it can be challenging to conduct multiple programs at the same time. Three, it can also be challenging to collect data when data are required on multiple programs. And lastly, it can be difficult to manage zones if a learner is displaying disruptive behavior. The comments that we received were helpful and very informative for us. They prompted the need for more training in some classrooms and a change in the environmental design in other classrooms. So now we'd like to share with you some video footage from some of our classrooms that use a zone supervision system at our school. As you saw in that video, a learner transitioned across zones while the staff communicated and repositioned themselves to attend to all learners in each of their zones. The video appears frozen on my end, I'm not sure. We saw it, Allison. We saw that one? Okay. Yes. So in that video, the class was initially a two-zone system, um, but became one zone after the learner on the right shifted to a man-to-man -man instruction. 
And then I think we can go to video six. That was five, I believe. Video number six, prosimy. So in that final video, you saw a two zone system where instructors step in as needed to deliver prompts or reinforcers and then return to their decreased proximity from the learners. So in summary, the use of zone systems at Nicely has produced several beneficial outcomes, such as increasing opportunities for communication among staff members in a classroom, bettering the environmental designs in certain classrooms to increase opportunities for peer interaction. It has provided opportunities for instructors to receive training in supervising multiple learners at a given time. And it has also encouraged Nicely to reassess the ease with which motivational systems and data collection systems can be transported between zones. Our job is to help prepare our students for success in school, in a work site, and in the community. And by using activity schedules and a zone system of supervision, and by programming for responses that promote independence, we can increase the likelihood of our students' successes. We thank you so much for your time and, and for allowing us to join you today. Thank you so much for really interesting uh, lecture. It's so important to point to zone systems, which really uh, are helpful in developing independence in children with autism. So I am very glad you have presented your research and your knowledge about zone system. It's, it's, it's important to know it and to remember it. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alison and Dr. Sue Werner. It was great to see you again and have a great day. Thank you very much. And thank you, Anya. Thank you. And I would like to welcome our last presenter and uh, Dr. Don Towns. Can, can you say it properly? <laughs> I don't want to make mistakes. Townsend. Uh, Yes, thank you. And um, uh, Dr. Don is um, an executive director of the Islands for Scientific Autism Intervention. And she's also the executive di director emerita of the Institute for Educational Achievement. She's our great friend and she helped us a lot from American side to organize and coordinate uh, all the lectures. So thank you, Don. And we are very happy you are with us and you will present really important subject about strategies for increasing simple interaction and more advanced conversational skills. Uh, in individuals with autism. And as we know, verbal behaviors are very important and it's also very interested uh, subject. So thank you for being with us and your turn. Great, well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure and my honor to be here with all of you today. 
I know we're running a bit late, so I will do my best to make up time where I can. Um, as Tanya said, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about increasing interactions from very basic, simple interactions to some more advanced conversational skills in individuals with autism. Um, as much of this has already been talked about today, I'll just briefly mention that obviously communication challenges are um, one of the biggest challenges for individuals with autism. This is often the result of poor attending skills in these individuals, failure to imitate those around them, um, but also very importantly, uh, the failure of social consequences to serve as functional reinforcers. So much of communication, social interaction is in fact reinforced uh, by social consequences. So individuals with autism, as you can well imagine, are at quite a disadvantage because these social consequences do not act as functional reinforcers. And when you have communication failures, yes, the individuals cannot speak and they can interact with other people, but there are also some other pretty significant uh, problems as a result of this, right? There is limited uh, participation in activities because of their lack of communication. Often there's an absence of social relationships. And these can, of course, eventually uh, lead to isolation. And that in turn will inhibit future skill development. So not only do these individuals have trouble communicating, they're also going to have a lot of tr trouble participating in other activities. Um, as you heard already by some great presenters, uh, communication is definitely more than speaking, right? Um, both joint attention and social referencing, which were two of the presented topics so far, are very important to the development of communication and ultimately spoken language. It is important that we teach not only how to speak to other people, but how to approach other people, how to attend consistently when you're talking to other people, what your uh, social distance should be in terms of a conversation, and of course, how you shift gaze. And you can see in those pictures there, um, a boy who's talking to two uh, teachers, shifting his gaze and engaging with them. So these nonverbal behaviors are super important to teach early on. And sometimes we forget to do that. We rush right in, start teaching spoke, spoken language, and uh, we kind of miss the boat because the individuals with autism may be speaking, but they aren't communicating. So I would encourage you first uh, to teach social approach to individuals with autism and to do it in a way that promotes independence. So often individuals with autism are waiting for other people to approach them, to talk to them, to have interactions with them. Um, we want to teach children adolescents and adults with autism to actually be the people who initiate interaction. And as you heard already um, by Sue and Allison, activity schedules are um, a very valuable tool in promoting this independence. And I'm not going to repeat the definition. You've already heard the definition of an activity schedule, but I will encourage you to think about using activity schedules to promote language and social interactions rather than just to promote independent routines and independent activity. We want to use these same tools to actually promote social interaction and communication. Here's an example of how you might start that um, very early on for even a learner who has no language. Uh, using an activity schedule here, you see there's a picture of a wagon in an activity schedule. The learner can pull that picture out of the schedule, walk over to another person, look at that person, and initiate by handing the picture to the person and the teacher says, great, let's go for a wagon ride. So even a student who has absolutely no spoken language can engage in this social approach response. After that, you wanna teach students that they should um, approach for interaction purposes, uh, maybe a social interaction and activity they enjoy participating in. So you can see in that bottom picture on the schedule, there's a hand uh, with a high five and a teacher. So the student, again, can be prompted by the schedule to go and independently approach another person, ask for a high five, and then the student and teacher can engage in an interaction together. The benefits of doing this is you've established some very important prerequisite skills, approach, attending, and social distance. 
but also, very importantly, you have already started the process of establishing social feedback, social interaction, language, and social consequences as reinforcers, which will be critical as you're later teaching language. When you're going to teach interaction, always uh, take a step back and think about these three things. What are the prerequisite language skills that the individual need, will need to engage in the communicative exchange? As much as you can, teach these language skills outside of teaching the interaction, right? A child who already has the ability to make a comment in maybe a discrete trial session um, is going to be much more likely to use that skill in an actual communicative social interaction. So as much as you can, Teach prerequisite skills and then move them into the teaching about initiating language. Don't wait forever. You don't have to teach everything before you start, but do establish some prerequisite skills. Also, as any good behavior analyst uh, should do, look at the function of the language. We know um, that language is controlled uh, by kind of the outcome, the function of that language. In order to maximize success while you're teaching initiations, you're going to want to determine the function of the language so that you can maximize the student's access to reinforcing stimuli, fun events, fun activities. That's why we talk, because we enjoy what comes as a result of our language initiations. And make sure there's a purpose behind the teaching that you're doing. Um, the language that you teach to students should be incorporated into kind of their daily functional routines and functional interactions. So where do you start? Once you've gotten that basic social approach uh, response in the repertoire, you'll want to start to think about adding some language, right? You're going to use those prerequisite language skills I just talked about as kind of your first language initiations. Um, you're going to want to teach as many different initiations as you can with as many different partners as you can. If you think about it, this makes perfect sense. We know that often it takes hundreds of trials before uh, the children with whom we work acquire skills. Sometimes when you're teaching in a discrete trial format, that's very easy to accomplish. When you start to teach language that's distributed throughout the day, we tend to really reduce the number of teaching opportunities that we provide. So make sure that you give the student many, many opportunities to practice the language interaction skills. And then rely on these tools we have in our toolbox activity schedules, and of course, scripts and script fading. Again, you heard a little bit about this already. Uh, most importantly, scripts are really just um, prompts that are formally used. They're words, they're phrases, they're sentences that can be used to start or continue a conversation. And what the purpose of scripts are is really to promote the initiation of language. So nobody is telling the student what to say. Nobody's asking the student to repeat anything. We are in fact giving the student a tool that he or she can use to initiate language on his own. Scripts can take many formats just like activity schedules, um, but ultimately scripts have to be faded. And the fading of the scripts, as Sandra mentioned in her presentation, where you may have a full script, look at my toy, then look at, fading starts from the back and moves to the front of the script. The reason it's important to do this and to do it slowly and systematically is what will start to happen is students will start to mix scripts together. They will start to actually, um, in fact, create their own language initiations. So the more you teach students with many different scripts, the more likely it is as you fade those scripts, the student will start to kind of combine those scripts and begin to create some of his or her own, uh, you know, novel interactions. When you want to start building these initial language initiations, make them simple. Again, sometimes we jump too far, we get too complex. Better to have a student say one or two words independently than to say eight words where half of them needed to be prompted by the teacher, right? Make sure they're functional and make sure that when the student is speaking about anything that they have a reference for that language. It has to be something that they have some experience with. Often you can start by using visual stimuli in the environment. 
some of those first interactions you're going to want to teach to individuals will be very basic social interactions that will be brief in nature. Like the wagon I showed you just a little while ago, um, you can now add a language initiation to that. So the student now takes that uh, wagon picture out of the schedule, approaches the teacher and says, wagon ride please. And the teacher says, sure. And then they will go and engage in a wagon ride. So what we've done is we've taught an initiation that leads to access to an item, right? But the student initiated that language and it was a social interaction. Once you're able to establish that, then you want to start to remove like the tangible items like a wagon and start to, in fact, make the activity social in nature. So here's an example of what that might look like. The student goes to her schedule. She sees a picture, which was the picture I just showed you on the previous slide of two people hugging. She walks over to the teacher, says, can I have a hug? Teacher says, of course you can. And she gets a hug. So there's still a reinforcing stimulus, but now it's a social activity as opposed to a tangible item that the student is getting. A couple things I want you to note in these pictures. Look at that the teacher is not in sight on that first picture. Look at the eye contact and kind of that connection between the teacher and the student in that second picture. These are the pieces of this teaching that are so critically important. And then of course, ultimately, is that language initiation where the student is asking for a hug. Once you're able to establish those interactions, you may begin to teach simple interactions that might be embedded in a task where the student in fact receives no reinforcement um, at all other than that social exchange. Here's an example of a student who walks to the staff room, finds the uh, teacher, says, oh, hi, Jill, and hands her a piece of paper and says, here you go. And then what will ensue from that is typically, you know, the pleasantries, the teacher will say thank you, and also some uh, potential conversation will follow as well. So now we've started to teach the student to engage in and value interaction for itself. Another very good strategy that you might consider using is uh, commenting on photos. This is a very typical experience that we all engage in. You go somewhere special, you do something fun, you see a friend uh, at work and you take out your phone and you start kind of showing them pictures on the phone and talking about those pictures. It's a very typical experience. And what's really great about using photographs to prompt language interactions is you have a visual discriminative stimulus that will ultimately be able to control some of this responding. And that will make this an easier task when you're first beginning to teach language initiations. And of course, you will use scripts once again to teach the actual spoken language. Here's an example of um, what this might look like with an, a young student who's first learning this skill. So uh, we've created a photo album for her. Uh, in the first picture, you see she's looking at the photo and turning the page. The second picture, you can see that there's actually a, uh, what we call a mini me. It's an auditory script that is on the picture itself. And um, she will push the button, repeat the script, says playing with my sister. So now we've got had taught her to look at something that she's familiar with, turn, look at the teacher, and talk to the teacher. Again, look at the shifts in eye contact that you're seeing in these two pictures and the connection during that initiation and that communication. So important. Here's an example of where um, same skill that you're teaching, but a little bit more complex, if you will. So this is a an older student who has a little bit more language and a little bit more technology use. So he has an iPhone and um, or an iTouch. On his iTouch there are photos. But what we've done is embed on those photos recorded scripts. So he sees the photo, he pushes the play button, and an audio script will play. So now he's able to flip through his iTouch photo album he is able to hear a script and then imitate that script. Um, on the right side is examples of what he's saying. Uh, he had just gone to Broadway to see the uh, play Aladdin, so that's what he's talking about. 
Uh, he says, that's the lamp. The teacher says, oh. And then he says he's making a wish. The teacher says, Jeannie brings him a lamp, and so on and so forth. What's important to note here is the teacher is not providing that behavior-specific praise we're so familiar with. So the teacher is not saying, oh, great, you said that's the lamp. Instead, she is talking back to him in a socially appropriate manner. So two things will happen. A, it is the social consequences of continuing a conversation. And B, he will be exposed to additional models that ultimately, language models, that ultimately he can incorporate into his language himself. So once you've built uh, those basic initiations, we're going to have to think about some of the next steps, and those include listening, reciprocating, and of course, extending that conversation. Listening is very important, but sometimes we forget to teach this to, to kids. Um, in order to have a successful conversation, you have to listen to what the other person is saying. You don't have to just look at them and speak at them, right? You have to speak with them, interact with them. So you need to listen. And then ultimately, the language of that social partner should change and influence your verbal behavior as you're speaking to them. That's how you start to have meaningful exchanges. And one way we uh, teach this very early on to students, because it can be quite a difficult skill, is what we call taking a poll. So it would look something like this. Uh, we give the student a clipboard. There's some <clears throat> questions on there. He needs to locate a teacher, and then he'll ask the teacher a question. So in this case, uh, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? And then the teacher will respond, and he will record what that flavor of ice cream is. So this is what it might look like. He approaches the teacher, excuse me, do you have a minute? She says, yes. What flavor of ice cream do you like? She says, chocolate. You see, he records the chocolate and he thanks her for talking. What we've done here is we have started to teach the student to approach someone socially, to have a language interaction, to listen to what the person says, and then to engage in some kind of motor behavior as a result of it and to leave the conversation. So this is the very beginnings of listening and then acting on information. <clears throat> very important because meaningful exchanges are going to require that we listen to other people. But of course it has to be more than that, right? Um, once you've asked someone a question and they've responded, now we're gonna wanna start to have that two-way exchange between people. So this is, going to get even more difficult. But if you've been building slowly, as we've been talking about, in fact, you can absolutely accomplish it. Start with fun, functional exchanges. Um, and as often as you can, pair some visual stimuli early on in the teaching. Again, this will help to give the student a referent. Um, so now they're talking, but they're talking, the two people are talking about something that they see. So here's an example of how you might do that. We um, call this reciprocal language with objects. We might have a bucket of farm animals and the uh, teacher will reach in and pull out an animal and can say chicken. And then the student has to engage in a similar response, pull out a different animal and label it cow. And depending upon the language level of the student, this can be a label that you teach the student. It can be a full sentence. It can be something um, in terms of describing the function or the feature of an object, right? But what we're starting to do is kind of get a back and forth between the two people where the language is related, but not identical. After that, you're gonna to wanna to think about advancing where you start to remove those visual objects, those visual prompts, and see if you can get an actual verbal exchange that doesn't rely on visual stimuli. So I might say, my name is Dawn, and the student would in response say, my name is Joe. As you're able to start to remove the visual stimuli and now you have language, controlling language, you're starting to move towards conversation. Ultimately, you'll wanna increase the number of exchanges that a student will have about a topic. So here a student is learning to say three different things about one of his favorite subjects, <laughs> which is Oreos. Um, I chose this example because he has very limited language. He's a very young student, but still he can say multiple things about 
the Oreos themselves. So we have a back and forth between the teacher. What you see there on the table are um, pictures. And the reason there's pictures on them is he has multiple conversations he will have. And then uh, ultimately he will learn a number of scripts about a specific topic. So now we've gotten approach, we've got initiating, we've got listening, and we've got some reciprocating, but now we have to start to extend that conversation. This is in fact, um, ultimately where we want to go, right? Most of what we do in life when we talk to each other is have more extensive, more fluid, more dynamic conversations. There will be multiple statements. We tend to talk about a topic, but within the conversation, the topic starts to shift sometimes. So we have to teach all of those kind of fluid aspects, dynamic aspects of conversation. Um, ultimately, it's important that the student is learning to make statements that align with the conversational partner statements and that in fact are um, addressing that person's interest and so that there is kind of, again, that continued connection between the two people. Uh, script fading, again, is another very valuable tool. Uh, here's an example of where a student is learning to talk about a topic. That's a schedule on the far left picture. Center picture, there's a box that will contain those scripts you see on the side. So they're written scripts that he will use to have a conversation with the teacher about a topic. In this case, um, he's talking about school, what he does at school. I'm going to show you a video of him having a conversation with his teacher once we've faded some of those scripts. And this is going to be a conversation about his family where he'll say, Delaney's my younger sister. Delaney and I like to watch Jumanji. Um, I like to, um, sorry, Derek is my younger brother, right? So he's going to say multiple statements and the teacher will respond back to him. Video one, please. Thank you. Um, so what we saw there is a longer conversation, right, between the teacher and the student. He's made multiple statements. He's remained on a topic, but done a little shifting as um, she shifted. And some of those statements, although you don't know, were scripted. And some of those statements were actually novel statements that he actually created um, based upon language interactions that he has learned along the way. Ultimately, it'll be important to start to think about how you can move conversation away from that very structured, like sitting at the desk kind of conversation or conversation that's prompted by the activity schedule and start to move to um, teaching the student to engage in a wider variety of language responses and conversational skills while he or she is engaged in interactions. So I'm going to go ahead and show you this video quickly between two students as they prepare their lunch. Video two, please. What are you going to do after school? After school, I'm going to watch TV. What are you going to do after school? After school, I might go bowling with my Uncle Chester. Have fun. Thanks. What are you making today? I'm making hot dogs. That's cool. What are you going to make? I'm going to make a Jersey Boys wrap. Cool. So in that video, you have an opportunity to see um, now two students. They are not using any scripts, um, although they've learned to have conversation as a result of scripts. And they're talking about something not related to lunch initially and then shift to talking about lunch. I'll show you one last video. Uh, these are students who are learning to play a game of cards and having a conversation. Hey, Dave, have you 
do anything fun this weekend? This weekend, I'm going to hang out with my dad. This weekend, I'm going to hang out with my dad. That's cool. I'm going to the gym this weekend. That's cool. cool. I'm going to work. This weekend, I'm going to hang out with my uncle. That's great. Draw two. What are going to do with your dad? We are probably going to duck it donuts. That's cool. Well, card green, draw four. Jake's turn. How about you, Jackie? What are you going to do tonight? Tonight, I'm going to have dinner. That's cool. So that conversation you see flows very naturally. Um, they're interspersing comments about their game and comments about what they're doing on the weekend and after school. Um, and this has all come as a result of the teaching that I talked about today. So that's kind of like a fast forward of what will come as a result of teaching basic interactions and then advancing to longer interactions, reciprocal interactions, and ultimately conversation as they're engaged in activities. Do remember, practice, practice, practice. It's what the students will ultimately need. And of course, what will be your outcome? Increased positive social interactions with the people in their lives. Language is the medium that we use to communicate with everybody we speak to and everything we do. So the more opportunity these individuals have to learn these skills, the more likely it is they will have successful interactions with others. I know it was super fast. Um, thank you for your time, for staying on late. I know it's very late in Poland and probably other places who are watching as well. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or just share some of your successes. I always love that. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. It was a really great presentation. Just, thank you. Just follow everything you said and we will be successful. Great presentation. It, it was also very nice uh, pictures added to your slides, so easy to understand and to follow all your suggestions. So thank you so much. I would like to say thank you to all my uh, American colleagues. It's, uh, it's really a big pleasure here with us and um, Yes, as I told at the beginning of the symposium, I was speaking Polish then. Uh, it's very difficult time now for Europe, for the world. And this is nice to see the, that we can be together, do things together and not forget about solidarity with Ukrainian people. So if you feel that you would like to support uh, the people who are who have to run away from their country, you can do it from our web page, Symposium Iwerde. And um, yes, hope we all will be safe and see uh, next year. And thank you for all the attenders. Um, I I really appreciate all the work you did. And uh, we just hope that uh, we can plan a next symposium and we will see again uh, all, all of you and uh, uh, lots of people from different countries. So this is also for us very, very interesting. So, uh, lots of people also from Europe. Uh, so yes, uh, see you again on the next uh, symposium. A dla polskich słuchaczy tyl, tylko powiem, że hasło pojawiło się, tak? Sympozjum i WRD z małych liter na stronie e, w fundacji iwrd.pl. W wejdziecie Państwo w zakładkę Fundacja, nasze projekty, webinary i tam wpisać należy hasło, które Państwo widzicie. Ono się również na tej stronie zaraz pojawi i będzie można pobrać zaświadczenie o uczestnictwie w sympozjum przez jeszcze następne dwie godziny. 
wpisując to hasło, które Państwo przed chwilą widzieli, tak? Okay, uh, so uh, thank you so much to all our participants and all people who are together with us. Dziękuję wszystkim z Państwa, którzy wytrzymali z nami do końca. Myślę, że naprawdę wykłady były tego warte, zobaczenie tego, co tutaj nasi koledzy robią wspólnie. And I just would like to add to all the presenters that all these uh, rooms, classrooms looked so familiar. We felt like at home home and this is uh, this is really wonderful to see that the model described by Kranz and McLanahan works everywhere in every single place of the world so this is great message for everybody uh, tak jak powiedziałam, oglądając te filmy czuliśmy się, czuliśmy się jak w domu i cieszymy się, że metody, o których mówimy i Państwu pokazujemy są naprawdę skuteczne bez względu na wiek, bez względu na rodzaj zaburzenia bez, czy problemów, jakie dziecko ma, bez względu na kraj, w którym je wprowadzamy. To działa wszędzie i zachęcamy Państwa do zapoznania się zarówno z naszą działalnością, ze stroną IWRD, z platformą edukacyjną, kwadrans dla terapii, ze wszystkimi naszymi publikacjami i zachęcamy do śledzenia naszego profilu na Facebooku, gdzie wiele naszych nowości i rzeczy, które się u nas dzieją, możecie na bieżąco śledzić. Jeżeli no, Wam się sympozjum... się też tak, też to... Po, polubcie proszę, tak się sympozjum się y, podobało. Będzie sympozjum też można jeszcze oglądać, y, więc też można jakoś poudostępniać y, znajomym, żeby mogli zajrzeć, bo na naszej stronie też będzie jakby tutaj nagranie umieszczone, bo były takie pytania. No i oczywiście jeśli Państwo polubią, będą nas tam śledzić wszystkie nasze szkolenia, wszystkie informacje na bieżąco o tym, co się dzieje w URD. Też to można się zapisać do newslettera i newsletter też wysyła wszystkie wiadomości na bieżąco. Zmęczeni, ale szczęśliwi. Cieszymy się, że tutaj... Technika bardzo... nas też nie pokonała. Wszystko tak, przebiegło wszystko dobrze. Także bardzo dziękujemy stronie technicznej. Wszystkim prezenterom. No, naprawdę jesteście wspaniali. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Dziękujemy za bardzo miłe komentarze i no, spotkamy się chyba za rok. Myślę, że to dobry pomysł, jak Państwo myślicie. Jeśli myślicie, że tak, to... To, to będziemy robić cykliczne sympozja. To też już było 12, ale no, zastanawiamy się, czy robić co robić. Tak, co chętnie, lata. tak, zdecydowanie. Piszcie, no bo, bo się zastanawiamy, czy, 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 czy taka po, co rok dobrze, czy taka potrzeba jest. No, wiadomo, jest to mnóstwo pracy. A jeżeli Państwo uważacie, że jest to dobry pomysł, to, to będziemy kontynuować. Nasi przyjaciele ze Stanów nas tutaj chętnie zawsze wesprą, są naprawdę fantastyczni, a także mm, zawsze chętnie się dzielą z swoją wiedzą i robią to e, oczywiście z największą przyjemnością i, i zawsze nas wspierają, więc to też cieszy. Także jeżeli Państwo uważacie, że to jest dobry pomysł, to będziemy w takim razie powtarzać te nasze spotkania. No i... Życzymy obocnej pracy, pomagajmy dzieciakom, no bo po to to wszystko robimy, każdy na swoim miejscu, w swojej placówce, więc trzymamy też za Państwa kciuki i do zobaczenia za rok. Hasło jest sympozjum i WRD z małych liter pisane razem. Jeżeli ktoś by jeszcze chciał pobrać um zaświadczenie i to ja je jeszcze raz pod... ktoś napisał, że hasło nie działa. Może jakaś spacja przy kopiowaniu, więc tu warto to na to To tutaj już uwagę. personel techniczny proszę o sprawdzenie, a, ale na pewno wszystko, o, ktoś działa. pisze, że działa, więc proszę, wszystko działa, bardzo się cieszymy, czyli nawet na koniec technika nas nie zawiodła, to dobrze. Czyli e, wola jest, żebyśmy się widzieli za rok, Czyli myślimy, tak. już, myślimy już nad kolejnymi badaniami, które zaprezentujemy. Pięknie dziękujemy, machamy, serduszka wysyłamy do wszystkich, takie, takie jak Państwo widzicie. Wspierajmy się wzajemnie, bądźmy dla siebie dobrzy, życzliwi i pamiętajmy, że wszystko co robimy, robimy dla dobra dzieci i po to, żeby Państwu pomóc pomagać jak najlepiej.